record. And here's our official welcome to session five of the UVM Extension New Farmer Projects Groundwork Program. Today we're focusing on managing equipment workshops, safety, liability, insurance, and beyond. Our presenters are Andy Pressman of the National Center for Appropriate Technology and Stephen Hadcock of Cornell University Cooperative Extension Service. Both Andy and Steve are also groundwork participants, so we, we just think that's a nice way to round out uh, our webinar series is to have uh, participants uh, leading our final sessions. Today's uh, webinar is also a rounding out of the hands-on training day last week where we focus more on workshop content and today we'll be focusing on the management of workshops. So this includes a range of logis logistical considerations that begin with pre-program planning and continue through the evaluation process. Uh, as is true with all of our workshop series, uh, all of our webinars, Groundwork participants have a lot of experience in this area as well, uh, so we are hoping, and Andy and Steve and I spoke about this, that folks will really chime in with your experience, your perspective, uh, and any questions. And I think that is it for me, and I'll pass it over to Andy and Steve. Okay, well, I'm kicking things off, and, and so thank you, Kristen. Uh, a little bit about me, um, I am an extension educator, alas not with UVM but with Cornell University Cooperative Extension across the border. Uh, the upper left corner, I'm part of a, of a five county team in eastern New York which we do border Vermont and those are some of my teammates. We were doing some program planning. My educational responsibilities are in market development and mainly though in beginning farmer. So. And, did one picture there showing some, one of our beginning farmer meetings, and then also uh, did an Annie's project this summer, this past winter in Boston Spa or Saratoga County, and so worked with a diverse group of of people ranging in in wide variety of age, ages and bringing a wide variety of life experiences and cultural backgrounds and so on and so forth to the their educational experience when I interact with them. So jumping in here and talking a little bit about trying to get people thinking about it from a uh, an educational perspective and also trying to engage and, and make people uh, enthusiastic and stay engaged in our in our classes and our workshops and in so talking first here in general this would include any type of educational activity that you're doing but also in the context of, of this since we are talking about the groundwork activity so when you're developing an educational program which I would consider groundwork to be it's a long-term multi-activity event where we're trying to over a period of time try to to affect some type of, of change positively in the in the selection and operation and you and maintenance of, of equipment on on farms then we, we really need to be thinking about what our end in mind is, is for this educational program. And then that e even trickles down to the educational activities that comprise our, our ag educational program, such as our these webinars, the face-to-face -face last week, and any other activities that, that we do collectively or you may do on your own. So what are some of the considerations when we are thinking about doing uh, some type of educational program or even educational activities. These are just three, but I'm sure that there, and I know that there are more, and certainly feel free to, to chime in with, with any that you may think of as well. Because we want, A, we want to make sure that we're affecting change and, and helping move the people forward developmentally, um, skill set, knowledge, cognitively, and so on. Uh, but uh, um, so we want to be able to measure that, and, but we also want to do it in an engaging way. So one thing, as a reminder about engaging our audience, is is the already on the Groundwork website are a couple of videos that Seth Wilner did on engaging um, adult learners, which are quite good, and would encourage you to go take a look at that. So the the three that I'm focusing on, and said so there are, are certainly more. There would be is is that we need to know our audience, who are our clientele. We also need to know what what we want to achieve or accomplish, at least 
have a dialogue with our, start with something and then maybe have a dialogue with our learners of what we want to accomplish educationally. But then the, one of the biggest considerations that I feel we have is time. It's more, probably one of the most constricting considerations or resources we have when we're putting together educational programs. So we need to, to have an idea of what our, who our audience is, our potential audience is, and that generally is some type of a, of a needs assessment. And it, and it can be formal, it can be informal, it can have a lot of ranges. But some ideas of some things to, to gain about and know about your client, clientele is that you want to know their demographics. Uh, what is their, their age, their cultural background, um, their socioeconomic status, all of what kind of life history have they had. Um, and that ties into the second part is, is the scaffolding. That's a developmental psychology concept that, and particularly in adults, um, they don't necessarily come as blank slates. They, even though their prior experiences in education may not be in agriculture or actually operating farm machinery, but they certainly have some snippets or something there that that they have learned something that they can apply to this new um, area that they're learning about, purchasing and using and maintaining farm equipment. So it would be important to, to get a gauge that that knowledge or where they are in their scaffolding. Also, learning style will be important. Uh, we all learn in different ways, and these are and there are a lot of different theories about how we learn. Um, some of the the big way, the big three that that you see a lot of places though is is that some people are are auditory. They learn more, better or retain things better by hearing. We also have visual learners that that. Uh, retain or learn better through uh, visual cues and visual uh, means. And then we have the kinesthetic learners, which are those that, that learn by doing, actually doing something as well. So as far as setting up your, your educational activities, you certainly, particularly with face-to-face -face ones, would want to try to make a blend of these so that uh, people can can learn in a variety of different ways. Then want to talk about our educational objectives. Again, a little bit of, of theory here. One thing that I like and that I learned and I use myself for that matter and think of it in these terms is the Bloom's taxonomy of knowledge or education. And it starts out at the at our foundation is we want to if we're trying to what our educational objectives are. Are we just trying to raise awareness or make them remember something? And then we're moving up that, that we want them to understand and understand the importance of, of something like this. Then we want them to apply. And then analyze would be critically reflecting on what they have learned and, and see and with the evaluation as well, critically evaluating where they are and how would they improve it and make something new or different to improve their particular situation and ultimately creating. They, they would be fully sustained and, and a fully, um, fully understand and comprehend and have a full grasp of it now that they're and have a command of that, that skill or that knowledge set so that they are able to, to uh, use it as they see fit. So uh, what we want to try to do in, in our educational programs, where are we targeting? Ultimately, ideally, I would say that we are trying to shoot higher on the pyramid with creating and evaluating because that's where true uh, behavioral change and adaptation is going to take place. But we also have to be mindful of, of the, the lower uh, parts of the rung of the ladder and doing something with remembering and understanding. So putting together our, our educational program, yes, it's good to look way out to see what we might be achieving. But don't forget that it's going to take some steps to get there. One of the things that, that um, you got received an email this morning is, is the next slide. And, and what I liked about this, hopefully I can advance to the next uh, slide. Oh, hold on a second. I think I'm froze up here. Do you want Just me to advance it for you, second. Steve? Yeah, if you would, sure. please. That would be good. There you go. Thank you. Sure.
is that is this uh, this worksheet on Bloom's taxonomy of um, worksheet or values. And what it what I like about this, and you got the email. What I like about this is is that it it gives you some some action verbs. That's what I like is is that when I'm preparing some educational objectives, I want to be able to demonstrate action. And so these action verbs are something that you can use as well when you're thinking about your educational objectives. It also gives you, even though this is more class based, it's giving you some some ideas of materials and situations and then potential activities, which um, I'm sure that you can modify and, and think about in your own settings what might be useful and what you can use. So if you could advance to the next slide for me, Kristen, please. Can you see it? Let me know when you're there. Yep, we've got the clock. Can you see it? I think we might have lost Steve. Chris, um, D'Amato, you, I think your webcam is on. I don't know if you can turn that off because it might make it um, free up, make the, the speed a little faster. The blackboard stopped working. Hey, Steve, we can hear you again. And Chris, we can still see you up there. I'm not sure what's going on. Or I can see you up there, at least. Am I back? You're back. Yep. So I do have faith that we're going to get Steve fully back here. But in the meanwhile, I hope people did get the email uh, that has that table on it uh, that he just showed us. Uh, we're applying action to Bloom's taxonomy. Hello. Okay, we've got you back, Steve. <laughs> Chris, you can't figure out how to turn off that your uh, camera, huh? No. Okay, I see you shaking your head. <laughs> so um, maybe Andy, should we move forward and sl come back to to Steve? Um, when he comes back in, I can also give him a call. So I'll, I'll, let's pass it over to you, Andy, for a minute, and then I will uh, give Steve a call and, and see if we can get him back on. All right. Well, hopefully everyone can hear me. I can hear you. Excellent. Let me see if I can advance the next slide here. Well, hi, everyone. Um, it was a pleasure meeting some of you last week. And for those of you who I didn't have a chance to meet or talk to, uh, I'd like to start with just a little bit of background about myself. Uh, so my wife and I run a small family farm in CSA in southwest New Hampshire in Jaffrey. It's called Foggy Hill Farm. Uh, Jaffrey is a few miles from the Mass border and not too far from Brattleboro, Vermont. Uh, it's home of Mount Monadnock. And, uh, it's pretty rocky soils, but a great town. Uh, but in addition to farming, I work for a nonprofit organization called the National Center for Appropriate Technology, NCAT for short. And NCAT started during the oil crisis of the 1970s as a way to find small scale, local, and sustainable solutions to energy and agriculture. And we currently now have about seven offices throughout the country. And uh, within our staff, we work on about 100 projects at any given time. Uh, but we're mostly recognized for a project known as ATRA, uh, which gets a little confusing here with all these acronyms. Uh, ATRA now is known as the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service. And through this project, which started in the mid-1980s, uh, we provide technical assistance to farmers and educators on sustainable agriculture and farm energy. And we do this through several routes. Uh, we have a 1-800 number, both in English and for in Spanish, um, where you can actually talk to a specialist, um, just like with Cooperative Extension, uh, and we'll address uh, your needs. Uh, we also write publications. We currently have about 400 of them uh, that are all online. Um, most of them you can download or view for free. We do have a few that we do charge for just based on uh, current funding situations. Uh, and I'm looking at the uh, picture here, there's a publication I wrote uh, 2011 called Equipment and Tools for Small-Scale Intensive Crop Production, 
which is a general introduction to hand tools and uh, tractors and implements. Um, again, very general, and my hope is uh, within the next few months to start a, uh, the second round of a series on tools and equipment um, for farmers. Uh, but we also have lots of databases on our website, and we also do workshops and trainings as well throughout the country. And even though I'm affiliated with the Northeast, and uh, our office is based in Pennsylvania, I, I have a home office here in New Hampshire, uh, but do get to travel around the country working with farmers. And so looking at the next slide here, I know several of you on the, on the uh, call today are affiliated with more longer term type curriculums and trainings. Uh, the trainings I give are anywhere from one hour to several days. And so just a couple pictures here. Um, I do hand tool demonstrations, um, walk behind tractors. Um, the upper right is a picture of John Maggie, who is the author of a book called Small Farm Equipment. Um, we worked with him this winter to do a small engine repair workshop as part of a winter conference. Uh, the bottom left, uh, last fall, uh, I worked with Shane LeBrake, who was a presenter for uh, one of our classes here with Groundwork, um, did a hands-on tractor maintenance workshop. And then the bottom middle photo there, I also do lots of workshops on appropriate technologies and new equipment um, that's being introduced. And the picture there is of a small combine uh, that was recently imported from China. Uh, comes in three different sizes. That's the smallest one there, two and a half foot head. Um, but we got to display it last year and, and harvest barley. Uh, as well as the bottom right hand picture there. Um, a couple years ago we did, uh, I did several workshops with uh, hands-on biodiesel production. So again, these last anywhere from one hour to several days and cover quite a bit of different uh, components as well related to, to equipment. So to start uh, in terms of the planning process, uh, I just want to mention a couple thoughts before we look at these bullets here. But overall, the more time you have, the better. Although I have run into situations where, uh, based on funding, uh, this can cause disruptions in a timeline. Uh, perhaps you write a grant or have some funder and it's based on a timeline, but the funding doesn't come through on time. Uh, so there are situations where you expect to have more time, uh, but that doesn't always happen. So I'm a big fan of not reinventing the wheel, and obviously, the more workshops you do and, and planning, the easier they come. And uh, I included a picture here from last week of, of Bill, and I just thought it was a, a good example of how how they really have tweaked um, their demonstrations to to really they just they've got it down. Uh, they know exactly what to bring to workshops, and and within the tractor demonstration here, they knew exactly how to tweak the tractors for weight and timing for rollover. So they just they just had it down, and uh, I don't know first day, but Bill talked on the second day about how through using these different models that he, he's taken from his kids and grandkids, how he's tweaked them um, through time to, to be more appropriate for what he's trying to demonstrate. So I'm looking at some of these bullets here. As Steve mentioned, uh, it's important to understand the targeted audience and what their needs are. And in terms of planning, I would add that uh, it's important to address how the workshop will meet their needs. And as Steve mentioned, taking into consideration differences in diversity, including gender, backgrounds, knowledge. Uh, and as Steve mentioned also, the, uh, the webinar that's archived on this uh, site for groundwork from uh, Seth Wilner talks quite a bit about this. And, and I'd highly encourage you all to, to check it out. And looking at partners and instructors and identifying who they are, um, each collaborator has something to bring to the table. So you want to play to their strengths. Uh, but you can also find out what's missing and, and at that point figure out who's needed and, and what they can bring to the, to the collaboration as well. I find a lot of value in including farmers in workshops, um, not only in terms of on-farm for location, but perhaps as instructors. Uh, but I've also noticed there, there's a lot of challenges with that as well. Um, for example, if you're looking uh, to work with a, a crop producer, uh, doing something in season is going to be a challenge. Or if you're working with a hay producer during hay season, uh, so trying to affiliate the farmer with also the timing can be a challenge. But I think there's a lot of value in that. And there's also a lot of value in name recognition, uh, where, where folks may come because they recognize a name or a certain farmer from their area that really relates to what they're trying to achieve on their farm. Uh, in choosing a date, um, again, I, I just mentioned in terms of seasonality is important to think about. Um, but you know, in trying to get as many folks to attend, 
um, as you're hoping to, uh, it's important to think about as well as trying to give enough time to organize. And if there's an opportunity to include a rain date, perhaps this is related to the venue or facility, uh, maybe something to think about. And there has also been situations where both myself and uh, instructors I have worked with have had to cancel at the last minute. And um, I, I think, you know, especially in the winter here in the Northeast, this tends to be an issue for travel. Um, but perhaps you may need a contingency plan um, if something like this happens. So we'll talk a little bit further about location in a few slides. Um, but I do want to mention uh, that I find a lot of value in having the opportunity to visit a location before the actual workshop. Um, sometimes you show up um, the day of the workshop and you, you see if there's some logistical issues and things that may not work. But if you are able to visit it beforehand, uh, really get a rundown of, of the, the facility, the land, the farm, it really helps in the planning process and you can really know what you're, you're going to be working with the day of the workshop. I included registration and fees here. Uh, a lot of the workshops I give are free and are funded through grants, uh, but sometimes you may want to cover your costs um, and charge just enough for that, or perhaps the workshop is, is a money maker. Um, but understanding this in, as part of the planning process, especially in terms of working with other groups, in terms of who organizes this and how is the money uh, dispersed through the groups, uh, something to plan for. And I've also um, realized more recently that charging also brings a more serious audience to workshops in, in, in many cases. Um, so, so for a lot of workshops I've been doing lately, I do put a charge on them. One in terms of if, if we have to register in terms of um, there's a limit in terms of what the facility can hold. But also putting a charge on really shows that someone's committed to attending. And if it's a small fee, then they may not shoot, they may be okay with losing you know, a few dollars. But if you know, $10, $20, uh, I think you know, it does show that they're serious about attending and uh, are interested in the workshop. So I find a lot of value in that as well. Uh, looking at the presenter needs, teaching tools, do they need flip charts, blackboards, a computer and screen, um, also having equipment and tractors uh, on hand, um, it all has to be part of the planning process. And uh, actually, I just want a couple notes back in terms of the registration fees. One thing I have also noticed is that folks tend to wait to the last minute to register, which is a bit frustrating in the planning process. Um, and I've also noticed that it does relate to uh, perhaps if you are charging to cover an instructor's fee, uh, that you may need to set a deadline just so you know whether or not you can cover the fee for that instructor or you, if you just have to cancel the workshop. Also important uh, in terms of uh, counting heads for if you have to order meals or handouts or anything, knowing how many in advance are, are going to be in attendance. So looking at then the last bullet here, participant capacity, um, both in terms of what the location can hold and as well as the instructor, what their comfort level is. Uh, I know uh, we learned last week that um, Bill and Sam recommend one tractor for, for five trainees. Um, Shane LeBrake tends to work with uh, eight to ten folks. He can have more tractors, but he doesn't really like working with more than ten folks on a hands-on workshop. I've opened it up to several to larger audiences, but I do think there's a lot of value in, especially for hands-on components, and having having the hands-on component as well as having a smaller group as well. So I'm working with collaborators, uh, understanding who they are, what their strengths are, and how you can play to those strengths. Um, but also their effectiveness as instructors or whatever their role is that they bring to the group. This could be perhaps they're a funding source. Perhaps they have good marketing abilities and have access to listservs or members that they can help uh, publicize the event. Perhaps they have a facility or equipment that you can utilize. So just sort of bringing everyone to the table and understanding what their roles are. And also uh, sharing credit and, and responsibilities, which may not always happen equally, but understanding whose role is what and knowing that this is the amount of time they're going to allow to that workshop uh, is important to know. Also understanding the needs of each partner. Um, you may have an opportunity to do a workshop 
under a certain need or grant that you wrote or program, uh, but bringing in another partner or collaborator, they may have a different need that can be achieved through the same workshop. So understanding what the needs are and how that workshop's going to address each partner's need. Understanding that there are differences uh, within the instructors in planning and in teaching skills and having respect for everyone. And also acknowledging all partners and funders. Uh, if you look at the picture here, this is a biodiesel trailer um, we funded a couple years ago, but you can see all the partners are on there, including the funder, uh, USDA RMA, Risk Management Agency. Uh, but on all flyers and information related to, to workshops I do that are funded through, through grants, uh, we do include the funder and acknowledge uh, where the funding has come from. And also looking at the press and how they treat each collaborator or group that's involved with the workshop. Um, and I'm also thinking here in terms of articles or reviews that they do or about the workshop. Uh, I've run into several situations where I'm completely misquoted or partners are and I, I try now to review an article before it's published. That doesn't always happen, but I, I highly recommend it if, that, uh, if the press is attending uh, one of your workshops. And also looking at proceeds and honorariums. Again, if you do have to charge how you divide up, uh, who, does, who collects it, and how is it divided up with groups, if it has to be. Uh, but I also find um, there's a lot of value in honoring or offering honorariums, particularly to farmers uh, who are giving up time out of their day um, perhaps you know they, they could be missing a market or you know getting a lot of work done. So they offering them an honorarium really uh, shows that they support your workshop and they want to work with other farmers to explain how things work on their farm and what they've learned uh, based on their experience as well. So the next slide here in terms of communication with collaborators. Obviously, the, the bigger or more folks you have involved, the more challenging it is. And I even see this now through things like doodle polls, where you try and get everyone to find a set time to, to plan and get together. And that, that can be a challenge. Uh, but I've broken this down here in terms of before the workshop, during the workshop, and after. And looking at the before, uh, understanding who does what, dividing up roles and responsibilities, understanding how much time it's going to take each collaborator to achieve or work through their roles and responsibilities. And also setting deadlines, uh, which can be a challenge, especially you know, how do you handle if one of the partners or collaborators doesn't meet that deadline. During the workshop, uh, making yourself available, especially when another instructor is up teaching. Uh, how can you be of assistance to that instructor? Uh, but also understanding and knowing when it's OK to chime in and add your input. Uh, based on your experience or what you want to add to the conversation. And also the system status check. Um, Steve and I were talking about this yesterday, but having the ability during breaks or times throughout the day to get together as instructors and sort of feel out you know, what, what folks are feeling from the audience as well as what you see in terms of standing up in front uh, and really seeing you know, maybe the back row is falling asleep or, or people are really engaged, but sort of just seeing what everyone thinks and coming together, seeing what needs to be tweaked uh, on the fly and, and how that can happen quickly, uh, sort of like quick, quick adjustments. And, uh, and looking at the pictures here, this sort of goes along with what I'm talking about in terms of this was a workshop we did last, uh, last year on um, cover crops and using a roller crimper. And the instructor we had for this workshop was in the tractor in the upper picture and was demonstrating a roller crimper and actually wasn't getting a good kill on his rye vetch. And uh, just a quick quick change in season here. His, his father came along in the bottom picture right away and uh, came through with draft horses and a disc and was able to show right away that you know we didn't get the good kill with the roller crimper, but here's another appropriate tool that we can use. And, and that's working. And uh, it was really, it made the point. But even though it wasn't what we expected, um, it really met the needs of the audience and what we were trying to demonstrate through the workshop. So after the workshop, too, doing a follow-up with your partners and collaborators, seeing what worked, what didn't work, also thanking them um, for being a part of this and really helping out and, and helping bring people uh, to the event. Uh, any post PR that happens, uh, I think there's a lot of value in doing write-ups about workshops, putting pictures out, uh, whether it's online or in newspapers or whatever, about the workshop. Uh, also focusing on the evaluations. 
um, what you've learned and, and how you can change things for the next time, uh, and including next steps. Uh, my hope is that we do a knockout job and that we can continue to collaborate and put on workshops in the future. So looking at location, um, as you all know, folks don't pay as much attention or retain as much information uh, if the right environment is not there. Perhaps it's, it's too hot or too cold in the, in the room or outside, um, if folks are hungry, um, or perhaps if it's right after lunch and folks tend to sort of doze off for a few minutes. Um, another issue I've run into uh, here in the Northeast is black fly season. Uh, it tends to be disruptive to, to workshops. Um, this also goes uh, for me, I, I do some workshops in the Deep South and in the summer it's just, you know, if you don't do it within the first few hours in the morning then you're just going to lose people if it's in the heat of the day. So the idea though is to create a safe learning environment both physically and emotionally and I'll expand on this here in a few moments. Uh, but also looking at distance uh, in terms of the location of the event and if transportation is needed to and from or during the event, if lodging is needed uh, for folks traveling a distance as was the case with several of us last week, also in terms of food. Um, if it's a full day workshop, is it are meals provided, is it included in the registration or are folks bringing a lunch or is it a potluck, um, but it all has to be part of the planning process. Thinking about the weather, um, including as I mentioned the rain rain dates, time of day, year can play a role, especially um, looking at the picture here, this is the workshop we did with Shane LeBrake and uh, it was a pretty chilly fall day. We were in that garage bay there uh, in the background but we had a heater going uh, when we were in there but then we were able to step outside and work with the tractors. Uh, looking at the facility, is there enough space to do what you want to do both in terms of hands-on or classroom space, can it accommodate having food, are there bathrooms, uh, and, it, and again, is it a safe learning environment, but also in terms of what's there in terms of tables, chairs, lighting, um, are you able to do tractor driving and implement hookups, um, perhaps maintenance aspect as well. And also the consideration of price um, and looking at what your budget is and, and if that facility can accommodate within your price range. And so at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Steve to talk about uh, risk management. Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, I'm going to actually jump back a couple of slides to, to finish up on on time management. And I'll, I guess you didn't really hear what I was saying about this um, either. This you got this as as in an email attachment or as an email today. But I really like this this chart. It's kind of concise and great in giving you some action verbs. I think when you're thinking about putting together some educational objectives, that you want to use action verbs. And even though this was designed for a different type of educator that's doing more classroom, which we do have, so that um, obviously fits well with you folks. But for those of us that are are, are not necessarily in a, in a classroom situation, these, these action verbs can still work. It uh, gives you some um, materials and situations where you might be able to use it. And then potential activities. So it, it's really a good um, one-stop shopping, if you might say, place to get some ideas to, to think about when you're, or if you are going to adopt something similar to Bloom's taxonomy to start preparing and thinking about your educational objectives. And what I was going to say about time is, is that this is probably our most limiting resource and, and something that you need to, to certainly take into consideration when you're, you're planning your um, educational programs. How much time are you willing to devote to this, uh, this educational program? If it's only going to be one, one activity and that's the whole program, the, it's certainly going to have a different look and feel than if it's something that is going to stretch over weeks, months, or maybe even years. And so the, the, the educational objectives, the educational activities, uh, the combination of educational t activities 
clearly are going to be a lot different based on the amount of time that, that if you're the key person especially, you're willing to devote to this educational program. So moving back to, to um, risk management, um, some ideas on, on risk management. We are dealing with something that, that is quite honestly dangerous, especially when we're talking about face-to-face. -face. Even when we're doing um, a webinar, you know, paper cuts can be pretty nasty at times. So we need, seriously though, we need to be thinking about, uh, particularly for face-to-face -face situations, uh, how are we going to, to minimize our risk exposure. First place to start that I would suggest is with your institution, organization, or governmental agency if you work for one school or whatever, is what, what risk management policies do you already have in place? Uh, one example of that would be is, is that um, some, some institutions, organizations may require blanket um, photo release, sign, sign photo releases from everyone. Um, other organizations like Cornell Cooperative Extension uh, really only needs that for, for youth. For um, 4-H, four 4-H four -hers. Um, adults, we can can get away with to some extent with or can get away with taking pictures and not having a signed release. This is what our policy is, and what our going to the second part, our insurance agent says is is um, allowable. Um, you, you need to talk with your insurance agent. Um, I know here in New York State, with an extension, any kind of thought or idea, we have to run by our our agent, um, and it's not all bad because they can help work with us to make sure that the agreements are, that, if, if any, that we need to sign are are not onerous on us. Plus, they may have some ideas on how we might uh, be able to mitigate our risk exposure. If you're doing it offsite at some other company or organization's pl place, you are going to need a certificate of insurance to provide them uh, that, and to prove that you do have insurance. Um, one thought would be is, is the, and again, consultation with the insurance agent, it, it's some statement of risk that everyone signs something that you might want to, to have for this particular uh, event. Another thing that just thought of that I liked about what Kristen did is, is that she made sure that we brought uh, and more uh, safety equipment or apparel that helped protect us. And, and that may be something to state up front as well. Uh, thought that we had yesterday is, is if you're doing face-to-face -face in a day long or, or even a half a day or something, consider having a safety officer. It's a could be a volunteer or you could hire someone that has a working knowledge of farm equipment so they know what are some of the risks and dangers of, of operating farm equipment. But their sole purpose for that day is to walk around and observe and make sure that, that all the stations and everything is being conducted in the safest manner possible, that people are staying back and not getting close to uh, the equipment at all when it's not appropriate for them to be up close, have proper ear protection, sh shoe protection, and any other protective, uh, personal protective equipment that they should be wearing for that particular station. So that's pretty, the um, uh, question is, is, are there are any examples of reduced insurance charges based on having safety training or set a site safety office? Not to my um, knowledge, Liz, um, but in my experience here in New York State is, is that unless you do some things that, that to, uh, with your insurance agent to document or demonstrate that you are mitigating the risk, they may not sign off on it. And allow you and, and provide you the insurance protection that you need. So um, I, I think it's more that the idea of it's something that's ongoing, and anything that you can do to kind of contain your your insurance costs will be will be good. Um, not sure of your. Uh, let's see. Okay, thank you, Kristen, uh, for that input as well. 
with that, um, I'll move on. And Andy, if you want to talk about safety. Sure. Um, and just also looking at the chat box, I just want to mention real quickly, I saw, I think it was Beth mentioned the idea of adding scholarships. And I think that's a real important component to, to add. Uh, I always try and offset the cost, uh, whether it's through the registration costs or through uh, the funding source uh, to include scholarships, um, whether it's beginning farmers or folks who are uh, at some type of disadvantage want to attend but don't have the means of, of paying the registration fee. So I think that's a real important point. And I appreciate you bringing that up, Beth. So looking at safety, um, as I mentioned earlier, the idea is, again, to create a safe learning environment, both emotionally and physically. And emotionally, uh, it's quite hard to evaluate this, especially pre-workshop, um, especially in trying to figure out what anxieties folks may have, uh, but in, in terms of creating that safe environment during the workshop. So looking at what their anxiety is, perhaps, uh, and, that, and through Seth's uh, presentation, he talks about learning methods and research that's been done based on gender. Uh, but you also have different experience levels um, that you may have to um, address, perhaps during through small groups or some focus within the workshop, uh, language barriers as well. Um, but also making it safe in terms for folks just to ask any type of question, not feeling uh, that they're going to be criticized for asking any questions. Looking at the physical components uh, within equipment and tractors, there's many moving parts, there's many pinch points, there's sharp tools around. Um, so being aware of that and making sure everything is safe, both um, for the attendees, but also uh, just this general idea that a lot of times we go on farms and there's, there's just tools laying around. There's a, a manhole cover open or something, and being aware of that. Um, and that's, I think, really where a lot of the pre-planning comes in. And if you have the opportunity to visit the site, uh, can play an important role. Also knowing that there's a lot of noise, uh, fumes, chemicals involved, especially if you're doing a maintenance workshop, you're changing some fuels, you're changing the oil, there's solvents, uh, and also recognizing how do you dispose of these um, at the site. Also looking at a safe space for watching, doing, and for storage as well of the equipment, um, especially if you set up the day before, or this is a, going on for several days. Uh, where can you store things that are safe, so that they're not going to be bothered or in someone's way? And also, um, as Steve just mentioned, the security aspect as well. And just looking at the slides here, um, the top picture is actually my nephew, who uh, he was in high school at the time, but he was about six foot six there. He's six foot nine now, uh, and he's managing a vegetable farm. But um, he got in a fight with some tools and uh, ended up the tools actually won. Um, but also in the bottom picture, just as last week we had um, ear protection and, and glasses for the workshop. Uh, this was uh, we're using a compressor to blow out a tractor, and we had masks and glasses available uh, for the attendees. In terms of outreach for the workshop. Um, this is an important component, and I try and always get the biggest bang for my buck. So I'm always looking at who the target audience is and how can I sort of focus on them the most, um, as well as investing in more localized sources of where the workshop's going to take place, um, as opposed to going to more of a statewide newspaper or audience. Um, you know, again, just understanding who that target audience is. Um, usually, there's a budget involved, and I and I utilize that uh, in terms of how I address the targeted audience. And so I'm always looking at different types of papers, newsletters, especially within collaborators of who their members are, if there's listservs, um, posting flyers, using websites, and uh, now all these opportunities within instant messaging and Facebook and other multimedia components. Um, and one I, I've been using, too, is constant contact and, and sending out uh, notices um, to which Again, I, I, as I explained earlier, people tend to wait to register, uh, which is always a concern, especially as you're two weeks out and you see only one or two people have registered, but they usually come you know, right at the end. Uh, but you also don't want to overwhelm them with constant email blasts or reminders that this workshop's happening. So it's finding that, that fine line where you want to remind folks, but also not overwhelm them and, and get annoying. 
I mentioned earlier too of recognizing all of your partners and also the funder. So anything for PR purposes may need to have uh, the recognition, but also approval as well. I know for uh, several uh, components of the USDA where I, I get funding for uh, workshops, uh, they have to approve any PR before I, I send it out. So that adds into the planning process that I have to give it to them uh, a few weeks before I actually want to send it out and get their approval and have to make any changes uh, that are requested. And also understanding that the component of registration, um, as we talked about earlier, and also understanding if there's any special needs for meals or, or anything else that's included in that. Um, and I also have found that sort of the new technology of where you can post things directly to a calendar um, from a registration site is, is a good use of, of a tool. So it just goes right in. And so look at the flyer here. This is that workshop we did last year where we are demonstrating the small scale combines. Uh, but we have all the partners listed on it, the funder, and sort of the itinerary. So this is what we sent out to everyone. And um, looking at the trailer, that's the largest combine that's being imported. But the engine doesn't meet EPA emissions. So it's uh, for research purposes. But the picture there is of the four foot header. And uh, pretty neat, neat tools. Looking at preparation for the workshop, um, obviously having everything ready to go for the workshop, including all the equipment set, any handouts, the evaluations beforehand, the audiovisual equipment that's needed. Um, and also, um, in terms of the tools, um, just a couple personal experiences here. Uh, I, I tend for hand tools and possibly walk behind tractors, bring a lot of my own tools and travel around, which creates two situations. One is I need a vehicle to, to handle all that, uh, which may reflect differently in terms of budget and costs, as well as uh, because they are personal, whatever I take with me means that they're not on the farm um, for use. So it, it could tend to create uh, some just <laughs> a little bit of situation within the farm um, as well. Um, but my hope is to eventually you know, find funding that to allow these teaching tools. Um, and so things are just ready to go. And as Bill and Sam do, they just load up and, and they're ready to go. And they know exactly what's in their, their box and, and where it is. And, and they're all set. Uh, and working with farmers or sales reps and dealers for tractors and equipment, um, through, through my position with a nonprofit organization, I have to be objective in working um, with these folks and, and not saying I support one brand over another. Uh, and, and many times I have to disclose this, that I'm not affiliated with that specific brand. Um, it could be interesting. I, I've had many situations where dealers are very excited to supply tractors for workshops like this, for safety, for uh, maintenance. They tend to ask a few more questions. Um, but what I also have noticed is that uh, sales folks may have a lot more experience in terms of engines and pretty much being more gearheads, but not a lot of knowledge in farming. And so I think there's that disconnect to be aware of uh, that they may be able to steer you towards a piece of equipment, but it may not be the right equipment in terms of your knowledge based on your soils and what you need to do with that equipment. Uh, so just recognizing that there could be that disconnect as well. Uh, one thing I have found very helpful in terms of working with dealers and, and sales companies is, uh, again, in terms of perhaps maybe not honor offering them an honorarium for the use of their equipment or tractor, but perhaps offering them ad space in a newsletter or a vending booth at a, a conference. Um, they, they tend to really enjoy that, and it helps promote their business as well. Having the opportunity to do a practice run before the event is always a great idea. Sort of work out all the kinks, make sure everything's running smoothly and that no issues arise. Um, that can be preventable before the day of the workshop. And also having proper signage. I thought it was great last week to see all the signs for the, the workshop last week. I know the night before talking with Kristen, she says it's real confusing to find the venue, but I thought the signage was great. There was plenty out there to show exactly where to go, where to park, and, and where the workshop was held. And uh, so look at these pictures here. The, the upper picture is a workshop, uh, a safety workshop we did last year. We had a brand new Kubota as well as an old farm mall in the background there. And we evaluated the different safety components of tractors. And then the bottom picture is just, uh, again, an example of signage for an event. 
And so I thought I would just close here with, uh, I was going through some photos with um, a few pictures of some experiences I've had where even though you, you may plan or, or going to a different event working with collaborators, things don't always work out uh, as expected, especially until you get there. So just looking at a couple examples here, uh, the upper left is a presentation I did. Uh, had a huge turnout, nice tent, great PA system. Uh, but looking at the monitor there is, is awfully small, and there was over 100 people in that workshop, so it was definitely an issue in trying to see uh, the presentation I was giving. The middle upper picture there, sort of the same situation. It was in an open fairgrounds, um, quite a big audience again. Um, but you can see in the background there's a couple of vendors, and then just past that were some more speakers. So it was a, a, a very tough place to speak. I didn't have a PA system, uh, and so I'm talking over other presenters. They're talking over me, so it was not a not an easy thing to do. The upper right picture is of a workshop I did in Vermont, just outside of Burlington. Uh, it's right in someone's farm stand, a farmer's farm stand, which was real nice. Um, we cleared it out. We had, it was very comfortable. Uh, but we had lighting issues that we just couldn't get it dark enough to see the screen. We tried putting up sheets and all sorts of stuff. Uh, so that was an uh, experience to, to learn from. The bottom left picture, here's a workshop I did in Ohio. Beautiful day. We're under a tree, but you know there's no tables, chairs. Folks are just sitting out there all day, um, so it's not not very comforted, comforting. Uh, but also, then the bottom right picture is a workshop I did in Pennsylvania. Uh, was in a, a museum barn, and this was just for the presentation component. Uh, but just having that that farming nostalgia around and, and creating that atmosphere, I thought folks really enjoyed. Um, it is a working farm as well, and I think that's where uh, I think folks really gain a lot of knowledge and, and comfort in, in the environment is, is actually being on a farm, having the equipment around and stuff. So it was a, it was a really good workshop. And on that note, I'm going to pass things back to uh, Steve. OK, thanks, Andy. So we're, we're coming down to, to kind of our conclusion here uh, and need to, to talk about evaluation. Um, so the Several steps that, that I would like to impart or share with you today would be is, is what to evaluate. Do you want to evaluate a knowledge change? Do you want to evaluate attitude or behavioral changes? Or do you want to evaluate the activity itself? Um, as Andy has mentioned, that, that um, it's difficult to, to have some learning take place if people are don't feel that they got enough food or the, f the food was not that great, that it's too hot, too cold. Um, they just don't feel like they're in a, we're in a safe or a good environment. All has an impact on that. A couple of websites that, are, that have some good evaluation materials at, are both at University of Wisconsin Extension and also Penn State University Extension. And I'm sure that there are plenty others. And feel free to share those either here or with Kristen and can add that to the, to the groundwork library as we go along. So evaluation design, what is the minimum amount of data that you need to collect that you think will, will be meaningful, give you certain good feedback on, on how the activity went, how the presenters, how good the presenters were, and then also in general, um, are they moving forward and, you, and, and did learn something indeed from this activity? Um, it would be, you don't want to overwhelm people with a, a, a myriad or a lot of questions, but you need to ask, have the balance between asking enough questions to get the information that you want, and then also so that you feel co confident in what you are, are um, what you're doing, but not overdoing it. So, what's the minimum amount? You know, why is it important? Why do you need to do these evaluations? If you have some funding partners or stakeholders, um, have it documenting impact. Um, for for this particular activity or your organization in, as a whole is important. But what else is important for you to to uh, consider in your evaluation of this particular educational program? Uh, some places do give an incentive to complete. There might be uh, a gift certificate or or something like that for for completion, um, some type of tchotchke possibly that will get people's attention and something they want as well. Um, 
all our things. Uh, in talking with Andy yesterday, we thought about uh, if anybody's had ex experience using iClickers or anything where you're getting participant um, feedback quickly and almost instantaneously, that's something else. It's one way, another way to engage your audience at in the event, but it's also a way to quickly do an evaluation at the end as well and capture that. And again, somewhat an incentive trying to make it as easy as possible for the person completing the, the, the evaluation as well and using some type of participant um, um, device or technology may be a good way to go to, to increase the, the incentives. So when to evaluate, um, it, the, that depends on, again, going back to your educational objectives, what have you set for what kind of, of, are you just doing remembering? Well, probably doing an evaluation, uh, one evaluation at the end is going to be fine. But if you really want to evaluate, to figure out if this educational program, program which may be going over weeks, months, or even years, um, you may want to, to also consider doing some follow-up evaluations over a longer period period of time as well to truly see what kind of impact this educational program has had. And speaking of evaluation, there is the one for today as well for you to to complete uh, for, for this workshop webinar that we've had today. So with that, uh, well, Andy and I would like to thank you for participating in today's webinar and if oh, we got still a couple of minutes left if anybody has a, a question or comment feel free to type it in at this point. Thanks so much Steve. Thanks so much Andy. I really appreciate you taking the time and, and as we're seeing if people have questions they want to throw up on the chat board or chat box. Um, I just wanted to uh, go through a few next steps. Uh, one, and, and this is stuff that we did mention uh, at the end of the hands-on training, but we will be now starting to uh, add resources to the Groundwork website. There's some up there already, but we will certainly be adding um, a lot of them over the next uh, six weeks to two months. So please continue to let us know if there are particular resources that will be helpful to you. Another next step is supporting your efforts. Beth will be following up with everybody about funding that UVM has secured that uh, we may be able to use to support you offering your workshops. Um, and also, uh, we need to track your efforts uh, because of our funding. Our funders need to know uh, who we served and who you all ultimately serve and how it's going. So that's a really important part uh, of our reporting back. So. Um, with that, we'll, I guess we'll look at the chat box and see if there are any questions. And again, a very large thank you uh, to Steve and to Andy. And I'm not seeing any questions yet, but maybe we can stick around and look and see if anybody wants to add anything. Uh, but we can officially end. And if folks want to hang out and follow up with some questions, uh, please do. Thanks again, everybody. <laughs>